YouTube, good morning. Welcome back to the channel, Craig Cloud IT Pro. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Copilot for Microsoft 365 and the security risks. Don't go enabling it until you watch this video. It's going to get juicy. Oh yeah, grab your coffee and your whiskey. It's going to get juicy. Copilot for Microsoft 365 security risks. Hold on to your hats. This one's going to get juicy. So Microsoft have have invested, you know, a lot of money and time into OpenAI. I'm not going to go into the whole depths of it. I, re I really want to focus this um, this video on, you know, the potentials of uh, of Copilot and also the security risks um, that need to be concerned around adopting it. So <clears throat> Copilot for 365 is 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 a game changer for sure. Um, and it really frees your mind from the tools and repetitive tasks so you can spend more time focused on what matters, like running your day-to-day -day business, growing your business, building your brand, scaling securely. And, and this means you'll be able to serve your customers better with Outlook, you know, land more deals and grow your customer base and build your brand more creativity with Word and PowerPoint. And, and Copilot is really embedded across all of your M365's apps that you use today. So you can now be more creativity, creativity, creative in Word, more analytical in Excel, more expressive in PowerPoint, and more productive in Outlook, and more collaborative in Teams. And the, the way that it's evolved is Copilot is making everything efficient at your fingertips. So if you get a long PDF, you know, go summarize this for me. I want, you know, five bullet points in Copilot. Draft emails based on user experience. You want to generate a new image for your PowerPoint deck? Copilot's got it. You know, you can have a cool feature in there as well. Learn new skills. I personally, I like to learn at least one new thing a day. It doesn't matter what it is. But Copilot really helps with that learning adapt uh, adaptability. And then getting answers for specific questions. You know, I get asked a lot of questions. Um... And sometimes I don't know the answers to everything. Um, you know, I'm not a knowledge base. If I was, then, you know, amazing. Um, and obviously that'd be quite annoying. But also, you know, if you get a complex question asked, you know, it's always good to just run it through Copilot just to ensure that, you know, what you're talking about is going to make sense. And, um, you know, the, the foundations of Copilot are, are really built around the needs for enterprise. So Microsoft have mapped their efforts to uh, the AI principles and responsible AI standards, which which I'll talk about in a minute. And, and they're really built on you know decades of research and privacy preserving machine learning. And these principles emphasize you know fairness, reliability, safety, privacy, security, inclusiveness, transparency, and accountability. And then by adhering to these standards, Copilot represents a new era of AI, which is ethical, responsible and aligned with human values. And Copilot, you know, it automatically inherits your organization's current security and compliance policies within 365. So data is managed in line with your current commitments. Copilot's large language models are not, are not trained on your tenant data. So Microsoft have worked to design an experience that prioritizes human agency putting, you know, the user in control. And the technology underlining Copilot is not, you know, an overnight innovation, but is built on decades of Microsoft's research in AI and natural language processing and machine learning. And that was my dog that just yawned then. It wasn't my stomach for anyone that's wondering. Um, and, th and this research has, has really focused on understanding and processing human language in a way that respects privacy, security, and really laying down these, this groundwork for Copilot's capabilities. And, and 365, you know, Copilot is, is there designed to augment human capabilities and, and not replace them. So the user experience is crafted to prioritize human activity, putting users firmly in control. Um, but there needs to be a level of governance in place before organizations should even think about adopting Copilot, even if it's just a couple of licenses. So <clears throat> the responsible AI governance framework is, is based on six principles that Microsoft have, have built the foundation around. And this foundation really frames the RAI standard and 
your internal policy, which serves as the guides for the deployment of AI technology. So if we start at the top first, we look at auditing. So auditing is the, cons uh, the context of RAI and involves an examination of AI systems to ensure they align with established ethical guidelines and standards. It's about systematically reviewing the AI lifecycle from data collection to model deployment to identifying potential bias or ethical risks or where areas where privacy may be compromised. And this process really helps in highlighting areas for improvement and ensuring that AI systems remain transparent and accountable. And then if you look at monitoring on the left, so continuous monitoring is essential maintaining the integrity of AI systems over time. So it involves tracking the performance of AI applications, ensuring they operate as intended without deviating into unethical behavior or discriminatory outcomes. You know, monitoring tools can detect anomalies or changes in AI behavior that might indicate, you know, issues like model drift or bias creeping or other, you know, operational risks that could compromise the ethical standards. And then we look at reporting. So reporting mechanisms within our AI governance framework ensures transparency, accountability, and they involve documenting and sharing findings from uh, audits, monitoring activities with the relevant stakeholders, including regulatory bodies and the public and internal teams. Effective reporting practice helps build trust and maintain and demonstrate the organization's commitment to ethical AI use. And if we go to the right, we look at compliance. So compliance uh, with legal and regulatory uh, requirements is the cornerstone of the responsible AI governance. So it includes, you know, ensuring that AI systems adhere to relevant laws, such as GDPR for data protection, or specific regulations governing AI use in healthcare or finance. And compliance also entails aligning AI practices with industry standards and ethical norms, thereby safeguarding against legal and repu uh, you know, reputational risks. And then just under auditing, we've got implementation, you know, training tools and testing. You know, the, the principle of this involves embedding ethical considerations in the, the whole development process, establishing clear roles and responsibilities, you know, deploying tools and technologies that support these ethical AI practices. And successful implementation requires a, you know, a cross-disciplinary approach combining expertise in ethics, law, data science, and engineering. And then just below that, we have the policies and standards. So these policies should really outline the, the, the guidelines for data handling and model development and establish standards for fairness, accountability, and transparency. And they serve as a reference point for all AI initiatives guiding them in making decisions throughout the AI lifecycle. And finally, we get to, you know, the principles, you know, the principles form the ethical foundation of the governance framework. And principles such as fairness, accountability, transparency, I've, I keep saying these same things all over again. Um, but, but these are defined in a way that reflects the organization's values and the expectations of a broader society. So these, these principles really act as like a, uh, a moral compass guiding the development and deployment of AI in a manner that, you know, respects human rights and promotes social well-being. And I know that this is quite a substantial list I've just talked about, but, you know, even with comprehensive AI security principles in place, there's still a risk of AI behaving in undesirable ways. And this would result in human activity controlling this behavior. So it's crucial, essential organizations to have robust security controls in place to help mitigate and hopefully counteract adversarial uh, actions in the event of a breach. And, <clears throat> you know, the innovation that Microsoft's doing great with AI, but all of this, again, like I keep getting to, comes with, with risk. Um, there are a few security risks associated with Copilot, you know, as I've mentioned so far. Um, but Microsoft have established this, this great foundation of, of security values and the principles within AI. However, the adoption of these principles is only feasible when your organizations possess a robust and capable foundational security baseline. And, and what does this look like? And this kind of, you know, we start with defining sensitive things. 
So the type and sensitivity of data held by a business can significantly differ across you know, sectors. For instance, healthcare organizations, they might typically deal with more complex and sensitive data, such as patient records, compared to a, a smaller business specializing in beauty products. And then for businesses to main, you know, for, for businesses, it's essential to maintain oversight for both the internal operational data, such as human resource details, payroll records, and financial expenditures, as well as any data related to external entities like customers or patients. A clear definition on how you define your data will ensure a rigid management and protection process. <clears throat> and then we look at the sensitive data. Might just have a little sip of water in a minute. Give me a second. So identifying say, sensitive data that resides in Microsoft 365, you know, it's it's very clear that SharePoint is is super important um, when it comes to storing documents. Give me a second. And uh, you know, it's it's like the backbone of the whole operation, right? It makes everything run smoothly from auditing to managing data. Um, it's it's not just a place where you just go and dump files. Uh, it's about coming together and, and sharing and managing information. It's got a ton of cool features with it as well. And it really helps keep track of, of you know, what you're doing with the document, who can see them and how they're being used. So this makes it easier for organizations to keep an eye on their important info, you know, how we identify that sensitive data. So getting a good handle on SharePoint and all it can do is key for keeping things organized, safe and secure. So depending on your organization's 365 licensing model, you may have access to Purview. You know, this is Microsoft's compliance solution, which offers more sophisticated tools for automated document scanning across your enterprise. And this will help jumpstart the identification process with sensitive data. And then we look at policy. So evaluating existing sharing policies, internal and external. And, and this, you know, Microsoft's approach has been designed to allow its default settings for seamless file sharing, both internally and uh, with an organization and partners, et cetera. And, and this approach aims to minimize user friction and facilitate um, collaboration. This sometimes may not align with best practices for data security, particularly for organizations concerned with data exfiltration and inadvertent sharing. So to safeguard sensitive information and mitigate the risks associated with unauthorized access or data leakage, you know, it's essential for organizations to critically assess and modify these default sharing settings. The open nature of these set, uh, settings through well-intentioned for user inconvenience could inadvertently pave the way for sensitive data to be accessed or shared with unintended parties. So by really adopting a more conservative approach to file sharing settings, you know, organizations can significantly reduce the risk of data exfiltration and ensure that only authorized individuals have access to sensitive information. This strategy not only protects the organization's data uh, assets, but also reinforces its commitment to maintaining robust data security. And implementing these changes may require a, a cultural shift within the organization, but emphasizing the importance of data security and educating users on the potential risks associated. And then we look at data classification. So in Purview, you know, there's a, there's a feature, um, if you're not aware of it, called Information Protection Label. This allows organizations to categorize documents by their level of sensitivity. So this implements categorization, you know, and, and empowers businesses to implement specific protective actions tailored to the security needs of each document. So you can do many actions like, you know, encryption of documents, limitation of external sharing capability. And, and these pro, you know, the proactive measures really take a broader array of security protocols designed to protect sensitive information. So consider a scenario where you know documents are tagged with labels such as public, private, confidential, highly confidential. So these these classifications are not merely labels, but they're gatekeepers of your data security, providing you know a robust layer of protection. And you can easily start with a straightforward approach by just adopting a single label such as confidential or highly confidential. And this can can significantly enhance the protection of your most sensitive data. 
And this is where Purview can help by by using Purview's, you know, trainable classifier. This is a tool which can help train and recognize different types of content by feeding data samples. And then over time, you know, once your organization becomes more accustomed to this practice, you can introduce uh, additional labels and leverage more tailored classifiers. And then we look at, you know, evaluating access controls. So it's essential to understand that effectively managing access rights, uh, particularly in environments like 365, hinges on strategic approach to user and group permissions. So the cornerstone of robust access control strategy is the utilization of group memberships over individual user assignments for granting rights to sites, you know, document repositories, Teams channels, SharePoints, etc. <clears throat> and this method really ensures a more streamlined and manageable approach to access rights, making it easier to oversee who has access to what within your organization. And it's pivotal. It's absolutely pivotal, you know, this part of the process. And it involves revisiting, you know, these change management protocols. And this encompasses everything from how new users are onboarded, how access rights are modified when employees change roles in the company to the procedure of offboarding employees. You know, leverage tools like uh, Enter ID dynamic groups. This will allow for the automation of access controls. And then we look at data lifecycle. So data lifecycle is, you know, Everything from data creation to classification, processing, usage, sharing, etc. And it's it's vital to regularly audit memberships to sites in Teams channels and verify that access is still warranted. Not everybody should retain indefinite access to specific files and, and, and folders, especially as, as roles and responsibilities evolve over time. And this rigorous evaluation helps in preventing unauthorized access and potential data breaches. And let's not overlook, you know, the significant privilege management as well. You know, the, the, especially for ro roles like IT support admins, who by nature of their duties may have access to a broad spectrum of data and sensitive data at that. And the principle, uh, the principle of least privilege must be a guiding force in your access control strategy. Ensuring that individuals have only the access to perform their roles and nothing more. And this approach is, is not about, you know, security. It's about minimizing risk and ensuring that your organization's data and resources are protected against both external and internal vulnerabilities. And all these, you know, controls can be correctly configured and implemented. But ultimately, if a user with high clearance or privileged access to, I don't know, domain controllers or Azure subscriptions or a, a finance operator with access to payroll and such things like that if those types of users get compromised and you have 365 copilot deployed in your organization then what's stopping the adversary breaching that account understanding that copilot's there and saying hey copilot summarize all my recently sent emails send a new email in the same tone as those emails and then include a phishing link with a new bonus scheme so right now they're <laughs> There really isn't a way at the time of this recording um, for us to be able to detect something like that. Because if the account gets breached and you know, they're impersonating the user, the user's not going to be aware. And although Microsoft have a great set of tool sets, sometimes these adversaries sit in the back for weeks, months, whatever. And, you know, Copilot will think this is the same user as always. And then the adversary might try and initiate, you know, data poisoning where the goal is to deliberately manipulate the input of data, compromise the integrity or functionality of the machine learning model. But by implementing the right controls, this will help mitigate this type of scenario. Thanks for watching the video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you don't, well, that's just fine. Please subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your nan. Cheers.